Okay, uh, welcome everybody um, to day two of 2024 Open Ed Week. Uh, the This topic uh, <coughs> uh, of this presentation is going to be focusing on the Commons Conductor. It's one of the critical components of the Libreverse, uh, and I'm pleased in order to be presenting this uh, for you guys. Um, so let's get the show going. Uh, in talking about the LibreText project and the Libreverse, which is the ecosystem of technologies that we are constructing for people to use, uh, it's oftentimes uh, overwhelming in terms of dealing with all the different URLs and the different applications and things like that. It's one of the reasons why we decided to break up the uh, discussion of the Libreverse into individual components during this week instead of trying to just rely on uh, an overview that we did yesterday for all the different components of that. Uh, <clears throat> that being said, uh, I, I would recommend and if you had to write down any one URL, uh, that is going to be this URL right here. Um, this is the Launchpad. It's available at launchpad.libretext.org. Uh, and it provides a map uh, to the greater Libreverse. Um, and uh, I will be showing it to you several times during this presentation. Uh, it's one of the go-to infrastructures or go-to pages that we have <laughs> available. Uh, when you... Uh, access that site, it looks something like this, or at least the top part of uh, the map. Um, and it has a series of applications. Those applications are part of the Libreverse, Adapt, Commons Conductor, Jupyter, Notebook, uh, Studio. There are lots of other applications that are behind the scenes. Uh, and again, this is meant in order to, to be a go-to map in order to be able to launch a, the application you care about. And what we're gonna be discussing is the Commons Conductor technology that both are integrated into the same uh, technology, but we oftentimes separate them into a common side and a conductor side, but they're tied together into a general commons and conductor. When you go to the Launchpad, you'll also get access to the 16 libraries uh, down below that you can review uh, as you want uh, that's out there uh, <clears throat> and uh, and such. So, uh, Jennifer, you get a chance to paste the Launchpad URL into the chat. That would be great. Uh, so let's start. Uh, I talk. <laughs> I start all my presentations in terms of the mission uh, that LibreText uh, is pursuing. LibreText is a not-for-profit entity. Uh, we care about mission over money. Uh, it's co-organized uh, through the University of California Davis, uh, of which I'm a professor of chemistry at. Um, and so we're implementing a community-built platform for the construction, curation, adoption, and adaption of OER that is comprehensive and be, can be curated at multiple levels. So each of these three bolded uh, words here are particularly important in terms of defining our bigger picture of what we want to be able to pursue. Each of the four words, or the four keywords in the parentheses are applicable in terms of describing um, the, the practical manifestation, the practical application of what we're trying to pursue. Uh, so I just want to discuss this a little bit before we get into the nitty gritty details. Um, so the first bolded word is community. Um, so while uh, we host a significant amount of OER content on our infrastructure, uh, that content is contributed by the community, built by the community, which includes both uh, efforts on our team and efforts outside of the team. It means anybody and everybody who wants to contribute to our mission uh, can do so willingly because we 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 offer our infrastructure and our expertise uh, openly to the community. Uh, this is different from, for example, a one size fits all uh, uh, creating of a resource and then distributing and, and saying everyone, uh, uh, you have to accept it or not. And that's that's that. So anyways, uh, OER, uh, we can define OER uh, in a variety of different ways that would take a, a while in order to discuss. Uh, for the context of this conversation, I'm going to define OER as freely available for students uh, and freely available for faculty in order to customize. Uh, there are lots of other aspects associated with it, nuances, and there's even not entirely a full consensus upon uh, in the community about what exactly OER is, but we have a general idea at this point of um, being able to address that, and especially within those scopes, that's important for we able to understand what I'm discussing here. Uh, the LibreDex project is comprehensive. Uh, while the project was born out of a chemistry project, um, it's now uh, including all of academia uh, <clears throat> across multiple fields. It's also interested not just in a horizontal uh, scope, but also a vertical scope uh, involving K-12 uh, all the way up to post-secondary and even graduate level uh, classes. So there are lots of gaps uh, that currently need to be filled um, and, and we're particularly interested in order to facilitate that. So we follow a no gap left behind policy. 
uh, we also follow a no tech left behind policy. So as emerging technologies become available, more specifically emerging open source technologies, such that we can integrate state-of-the-art technologies into the Libreverse so that faculty and students can actually use that content without having to worry about the barriers oftentimes uh, encountered in implementing those technologies. So we do this in order to be able to advance openness because uh, it's clear, uh, um, as anyone this century is clear that uh, uh, education is slowly evolving to educational technology uh, and technology is a critical component in terms of moving uh, our uh, learning experiences forward. Uh, and lastly, uh, the key aspect behind how we've constructed the Libreverse is that the content is meant to be curated. Uh, in short, uh, there's a need in order to make sure that the content is stored in dynamic living libraries, that you have the ability to come in, edit, update, customize as needed in order to be able to move forward. This is the opposite of a dead non-dynamic library like a repository of PDFs. Uh, that is not useful uh, for many purposes that we want to be able to address. So it's important in order to be able to have a dynamic infrastructure in order to move forward. So the upshot of what we're trying to do is to break the golden handcuffs that commercial publishers provide to faculty <laughs> and invariably departments and campuses such that faculty come in and they adopt the book and they adopt the homework system and they adopt the uh, ancillary materials and they adopt the PowerPoint slides and such like that. And it becomes very difficult in order to extricate those faculty from uh, the golden handcuffs that the publishers have provided because they need to, uh, we need to provide every single resource that the publisher puts together. We're, what that means is that the LibreText project, uh, in order to advance the goal of extricating uh, faculty from these golden handcuffs, uh, addresses each of these aspects. So you'll find a technology focusing on text not, textbooks, a technology focusing on homework system, a, a technology focusing on distributing of ancillary materials. Soon we'll have a technology for hosting of videos and basically provide a one-stop shopping experience, which is essentially meant to mirror what commercial publishers put out there. The issue behind this is that no one technology is able to handle all these different aspects. So the Libreverse has a range of different technologies uh, where the technologies focuses on what they're designed for uh, and then not pushing them beyond the scope of what they're uh, intended for designing because that right there is oftentimes an exercise of futility and certainly a poor return on investment than using it, a technology that's designed for handling a certain topic. So what is the Libreverse? I mentioned the Libreverse is an ecosystem of multiple technologies. Um, we're only going to be addressing one technology here, the Commons and Conductor, but the overall Libreverse is designed to have several different primary uh, emphases. Uh, one focuses on uh, the Libreverse as a construction platform, uh, and that's what the Commons and Conductor is well suited for uh, addressing. It's also uh, set up as a dissemination platform. Uh, in fact, the LibreText project as a whole, and including the Libreverse, uh, is the most popular OER textbook repository out there. We deliver some, We have delivered somewhere close to 1.2 billion page views with a B since we started in 2008. Uh, we operate at the enterprise level. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and that means that we actually have the most popular uh, or let me phrase that, we have lots of traffic uh, per day that we need to address. If someone has created OER, there is no better platform in order to distribute that uh, to the community uh, than the LibreText project. Lastly, because we're academics, or most of the people on the LibreText team are academics, uh, we're particularly interested in order to make sure that the Libreverse can be used as a learning platform, not just as a construction or dissemination platform of OER. And there are different aspects associated with that. Much of it is beyond what the topic is of this presentation, um, but I'll be discussing it a little bit near the end in terms of learning analytics in order to guide um, pedagogies uh, and, uh, and development of OER based on feedback that students are able to generate, um, and in some cases, passive uh, feedback by just usage statistics. So the Libreverse, when you actually take a snapshot of that, has a core set of libraries. These are wiki-based technologies. There are 16 independent libraries. Each library focuses on a specific field. For example, we have a chemistry library. We have a physics library, a social sciences library. We have a Spanish library or Espanol library that's meant in order to host OER in Spanish. Ukranski library in order to handle displaced students in the war in Europe. Um, and we're planning on expanding the global libraries of different languages uh, in the near future. 
So those constitute our hub, or constitutes the hub of the Libreverse. And then ancillary to that are all these other technologies that are necessary in order to advance this um, the scope that the Libreverse is meant to advance. The thing that we'll be talking about uh, right now is the commons and conductor uh, infrastructure. And right. uh, in a few hours, I'll be discussing a bit more about how to construct uh, and use the ADAPT homework system if people are interested in sticking around. Uh, the Libreverse is optimized for uh, at scale collaborative construction efforts. <coughs> <coughs> Uh, uh, and the idea behind here is that content that's stored on our platform, whether it happens to be textbooks or homework systems or ancillary materials, are interconnected and weaved with uh, you know, threads of connectivity in order to be able to identify uh, what's connected to a specific project uh, or a specific resource. So uh, let's go into the Commons of Conductor. Um, so the Commons Conductor is a very peculiar name for a platform, uh, and it's named that way because the front end is the Commons and the back end is the Conductor. And the front end is available for anyone to access. Um, it's a front end cataloging system. That's largely what's uh, its primary use. Uh, so when you actually generate and publish a book, uh, it goes into our catalog. Uh, and it provides an opportunity for faculty, students, anyone who wants to find books can pursue that. Um, that includes being able to store books, including being able to store the content in libraries, uh, collections, if you have little mini repositories of books or repositories of other uh, components on the Libreverse, you can put that in place. Uh, it allows for uh, a cataloging of homework system. Uh, it will allow to catalog of assets, ancillary materials, which I'll show you an example of momentarily. It allows you to identify projects that are under development. Uh, and the intent off of that is to ensure that when you're creating a project or when authors are creating a project, they can look to see if other projects are being created somewhere else uh, that address the scope of that project that they're working on. In other words, and make it so that we don't have to recreate the wheel, capitalizing on the sharing is caring model of OER. Uh, and that's only useful when you know what other people are doing and the Libre and the Commons and Conductor specifically is able to facilitate them. We have two flavors of Commons and Conductors. We have a central one, which we refer to as the Libre Commons sometimes, or just Commons in general. It's an instance that we curate that's associated with the overall Libre Text project. However, when campuses or districts or even when states get uh, uh, join our LibreNet consortium, which is our sustainability model, they can get their own branded instance that they're able to uh, use as a cataloging, which provides a mechanism in order to distribute their OER content to relevant stakeholders holders, whether they happen to be students, faculty, administrators, um, external <clears throat> uh, uh, supporters, um, uh, alumni, and such in order to demonstrate uh, what they're pursuing with OER. Um, that's the front end. So in other words, uh, anyone without an account, which is everyone in the world, can have access to any of these resources that's publicly available because the point is that this is a front end approach. The back end requires an account. An account is freely available uh, uh, via our infrastructure at one.libretext.org. Uh, there was a link uh, to that that's in our chat. So if you don't have an account on our system, I encourage you to go to that link that's put into the chat uh, and request an account. Uh, they are manually verified because we want to be able to make sure that we can uh, distinguish between student accounts and faculty accounts because faculty accounts oftentimes have access to more resources than student accounts um, and we want to separate the two as many authors want. Uh, so the back end once you sign in and you get access to this thing uh, is a project building tool. In fact it's the to my knowledge the only project building tool that's focused around OER uh, uh, and OER needs. Uh, it's well designed in order to operate with building projects within the that's meant to be stored within the LibreText uh, infrastructure, like a LibreText book or a homework system such, but you can use it as a, a project management tool um, for uh, platforms that are not connected to LibreText. For example, if you want to build a press books book, you can use this as a project management tool in order to facilitate that because they don't have that infrastructure within press books. It will make me cry, but it's still possible. And it's a service that we provide to the community. Uh, we have an infrastructure set up in order to provide alerts. So you can come as an instructor and request to get notified if a specific resource comes in to the LibreText with a specific metadata or, or term. For example, if I want to come in and say, 
calculus. Any resource that comes into our platform has calculus. I will get an email notification saying that this resource comes in. It makes it uh, uh, facilitates if I'm constructing the book, uh, constant real time feedback about what resources I have available in order to help build that resource. Um, but it also just facilitates it once the book is done in order to know if there's other resources that I may want to review in order to continue uh, advancing my uh, open agenda. Uh, the conductor facilitates harvesting. Uh, harvesting is the term that we use for integrating existing OER into the Libreverse. Uh, <clears throat> so while the Libreverse is the largest central repository of uh, OER textbook material at somewhere in the order of 950 thousand pages of content. There's lots of OER that's not stored in our uh, infrastructure for a variety of reasons. Oftentimes, we're, it's just basically time in order to integrate it. So if individuals uh, desire to have content, OER content brought into our platform, they can request it via a, a harvesting request. Uh, adoption, uh, the conductor provides a mechanism in order to keep track of uh, self-registered adoptions of resources, which is useful in order to be able to demonstrate impacts of books or impacts of programs uh, in a more quantitative uh, way. It facilitates peer review uh, because it's important in order to be able to get feedback from uh, faculty uh, and authors that uh, would potentially adopt. Um, peer review can also be used in order to get feedback from students. In that case, there's not necessarily peer review, but just external review feedback. But the idea is to be able to provide a centralized infrastructure of getting responses back from the community. Uh, it facilitates communication. Uh, in short, uh, it allows teams in order to be able to talk to each other uh, or talk within the, each other, in which within the teams, in order to be able to advance uh, their their approach. You can build themes or threads that is uh, focusing on specific topics, uh, and you can uh, assign a handful of other features associated with that. It's better in order to show these things real time, but I'm going to show you a few snapshots of these things just to uh, whet your appetite. So this right here is the front end commons to Prince George's Community College. Prince George's Community College is a community college um, in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, and uh, if you go to this website, and it's pgcc.libertex.org, uh, um, I can provide the link to it, or I can show you how to access this if you're interested in looking at this one specific campus commons. They're a member of our LibreNet. Um, they get a branded instance that they can come in and uh, add images as necessary for them. And they have 65 books that uh, are reviewable by, again, stakeholders in order to uh, parse through this um, and such. If we actually flip to a different commons and conductor, in, the, in this case here, it's the commons associated with the California Education Learning Lab that we've been augmenting the commons and conductor in order to facilitate not just the organization of textbooks, but the organization of assets. So they've generated uh, via multiple projects, a series of assets, um, <clears throat> oftentimes images, sometimes uh, worksheets, sometimes other learning objects um, that are meant to be stored as files and not necessarily stored as pages on a textbook. Uh, <clears throat> they are loading up their uh, Commons and Conductor uh, right now with 130 different assets, although they're going to be uh, adding probably multiple thousands of assets here. And this provides a mechanism in order to do searches. For example, you can come in and say, I want to look at a PowerPoint file dealing with transverse waves or some other topic like that. And you can look at the resources that you have available in order to be able to advance that. The key point is that this is uh, logistically separated from the books in order to make it easier in order to recognize what you're looking for. You can also do searches through projects in order to find out what other projects exist. Every uh, book uh, has a conductor project page connected to it that you can do a search for. So talking about the conductor, uh, let's go to the back end, again, requiring an account in order to access it. When you access the uh, conductor page, and I'm going to show it to you real time momentarily, you have a series of assignments, or let me phrase it, a series of conductor projects. And the projects are what you use in order to organize these things. So this is a top end of a project <laughs> uh, addressing uh, uh, augmenting organic chemistry using calculations. Uh, as a series, uh, as a summary, it has some user uh, names connected to it and some other information here connected to the source uh, in order to be able to have communication with the original author uh, that, that's connected to it. Uh, you'll notice that it has uh, 
a mechanism for managing team where you can add individuals to the team. It has a timeline. A timeline will uh, is useful within the context of having uh, subtasks or tasks that you can then assign dates to. You can make Gantt plots in order to organize the flow. You can look at it through a standard um, calendar approach for things. We have a mechanism to facilitate peer review, storing peer review, and more importantly, uh, being able to curate the peer review. Because if a peer review has actionable information that you can use in order to improve the resource, and you do improve the resource, the peer review's utility is essentially significantly reduced if you were to keep it up. And this is the big issue or pet peeve I have with other projects that just have loads of peer reviews that may be a decade old that have no applicability for describing the way the situation was uh, now because the authors have already updated them and just does a disservice in order to maintain that up. Um, and I encourage people who look through these reviews in order to pay attention whether the people who host them are actually uh, doing a service by keeping track of all the reviews to people. Anyways, we have the ability in order to curate, meaning be able to delete and respond to reviews. We have an accessibility infrastructure in order to facilitate uh, <clears throat> fairly detailed, in fact, the most detailed uh, accessibility performance review infrastructure per textbook uh, in the OER landscape. It's well optimized for Libre textbooks. Uh, it doesn't work with other OER platforms. If you were to build a book on, plat on press books, um, or you'd have to manually create it, and I'll show you how it actually works uh, in a moment. And then we have more tools, which currently the Remixer uh, is hosted on there. The Remixer uh, is a topic uh, for the textbooks, but it's a tool in order to be able to take content and uh, of the 950 pages of content, that 1,000 pages of content that we have on our system and rearrange them and organize them in order to construct a, a, a new OER resource. I mentioned that the conductor page is where we store our assets. The assets that uh, I showed you before with the, uh, in this case here, the commons, this is the presented to everybody without an account with the conductor account gives you the ability to upload them and apply all the metadata that you expect from an openly uh, open educational resource, uh, including author attribution, source, version numbers, and such like that, uh, so in order to ensure full compliance with the licensing that's there or to provide the information to other uh, authors in order to know what the, the, the licensing is of those resources. Um, <clears throat> this right here, while that the front end, the, slide right here was dealing with files, assets. This right here deals with tasks. This is a different project dealing with constructing of the solutions for OpenStax uh, general chemistry book, because we, uh, we need to augment the OpenStax questions or specifically the solutions with pedagogically useful uh, solutions instead of just simple small little blurbs that we, we, we feel are not overly important useful uh, from a learning perspective by students. So we have a series of chapters and we have users. Uh, most of those users have been removed here, um, but they were all used uh, in order to build these resources and move it forward. Uh, and it's those tasks that you can then organize uh, in Gantt plots uh, or taking a looking at, take a look at them through a calendar-based system. Um, just a couple more slides, and then we'll get into the actual platform and move things around so you can see uh, what it looks like in real time. But I wanted to lay the groundwork about what to look for as we actually uh, open this up. So you may remember I was talking about the Libreverse dealing with addressing uh, construction uh, or authoring, dealing with dis uh, dissemination, uh, and then also dealing with learning. Uh, and within the, uh, the the learning lot, uh, sorry, within the uh, conductor side of the comments and conductor uh, somewhere near the end of uh or in the middle of spring, we'll release our next version of learning analytics uh, that provides an opportunity for authors uh, uh, or administrators for the, the commons the campus commons in order to identify the analytics of how uh, resources are used. Um, and this is an example of how you can use this in order to guide pedagogy. So about uh, nine years ago, I, uh, I reported a project that we had done where uh, I taught two back-to-back -back classes of 500 students each. You know, so I taught 1,000 students one quarter. Uh, I'm never going to do that again because it wasn't a terribly pleasant experience, uh, but it was a very useful experience in order to be able to evaluate the efficacy of the ChemWiki. The ChemWiki is the precursor to the LibreText project. Uh, so what we did uh, is one of those 
<laughs> one of those classes used the chem wiki and the other class used the uh, the conventional textbook that they had to pay for, which was somewhere in the order of 200 to $250 a book. And uh, in looking at just the chem wiki project, I was able to identify how students uh, uh, per day, just the traffic of page views. This is just one snapshot of the analytics that we're able to, to review. This is aggregate over the course. I'm able to identify this at an individual student level. Uh, and what I noticed very obviously here is that students studied a lot right before the exam. Now, it's not surprising that students cram. Um, we all know that students cram or we all remember cramming when we were a student, uh, but I was able to use this information in order to ask the question, what does the impact of cramming have on performance? Or I should actually write that in a slightly different way is, what's the performance of the students that cram um, compared to the students that don't cram? Because I want to make sure it may not be a cause and effect, it may be causation. So the... the uh, <clears throat> Uh, this provided a mechanism in order to identify the students that cram performed about 10% poorer uh, on their class, on their exams, than the students that didn't cram. Now, I didn't have information on longitudinal studies about the impact on the next term. Uh, however, now that we're getting a larger adoption of courses, we're able to be able, we're able to track that sort of information. Um, and the analytics that we're going to be reporting is the first step in order to provide that information to authors. So in other words, when authors create a resource, a textbook, for example, they're able to identify uh, using the Commons and Conductor platform how the students are interacting with those resources and then guide, use those resources to give actual information and also to provide uh, detailed information on the efficacy of the resources being created. So in this case here, from a pedagogical perspective, I decided to try to do a change over the summer where I made uh, students do weekly quizzes instead of midterms. Uh, and the hopes were to get the background up compared to the peak of studying right before the exam, which is exactly what happened. Yes, the people study right before the exam because of standard timing, procrastination, other issues like that. Uh, but this was a success in terms of guiding my pedagogy using these details off here. However, unfortunately, I can't compare the performance of the students in this class versus this class because the timing of this class was different. This was a summer class. The cohort is different. It's a completely different class, and I can't. Again, can't show about why this is better than this, but it it, uh, it intuitively makes sense. And we have data if we were to continue this in order to be able to identify that. This is a snapshot of the current analytics that we are upgrading uh, that shows it for my general chemistry class. Uh, in blue shows the reading per uh, of the book per day. Uh, and you can see, yes, I do have an exam right here. And yes, I do have an exam right here when you look at the blue uh, breakdown here. And then I looked at a specific page, 3.2 intermolecular forces page, and identify when students were studying that page. Uh, and again, these are detailed information I can use in order to identify uh, and modify pedagogy, but also to identify if I want to change things. Like if I ask the students to read a specific page over the weekend, I can then take a look and see, are the students reading that page? at least if they're doing it all online. If they print things out as PDFs or text-based versions, we're not able to track that, obviously. So um, with that little overview in place, I just want to end with what I started, which is our mission statement. We're implementing a community-built platform for the construction, curation, adoption, and adaption of OER that's comprehensive and can be curated at multiple levels. Uh, and the Commons Conductor is just one component associated with being able to advance that. So if you haven't had any, if you don't have an, a, an account on the Commons Conductor, I again encourage you in order to request a free account, there's a link that was put into the chat here. Um, and if you have your account already verified, please sign in. Uh, for those of you that didn't have an account, uh, uh, but request an account, we'll take a look at sometime in the next few hours in order to update it. And then you're gonna be able to um, uh, follow through with this uh, when the time becomes available. So right now I'm going to switch to real time since we have a bit of time left over. If anyone has any questions over that general overview, I encourage you in order to throw it out. Um, so uh, we can have something to chat about before me, before I uh, bring up the resource itself. No one seems to be, uh, commenting on here, or at least asking a question. Uh, Dr. Mo is excited, which we're excited to. Okay, so let's get this going here. So if you go to uh, 
launchpad.librotex.org, uh, the link that was put into the chat, which actually was not. So I'm just going to paste it right here. launchpad.librotext.org. Uh, it also has a different URL. Uh, that's one.librotext.org slash home. It uh, doesn't really matter which one you use. The key point is you go into this map. And like I mentioned before in that PowerPoint presentation, we have a series of, in this case here, uh, applications that are part of the Libreverse and 16 of these libraries that are wiki-based in order to host the content that we have available. Uh, so uh, I'm not signed in right now, uh, but I don't need to be signed in. I'm going to go to the commons in order to show the front end that, again, does not require signing in in order to be able to address, although I am signed in once I go into here. So this is the central commons, the, co the commons that's part and let me phrase the commons that's meant to address the entire Libreverse. It's not a campus commons. Um, so this one is attributed to LibreText and branded to LibreText. It has a simple text on the front here. Uh, and the idea, again, is to provide an infrastructure as a catalog for people in order to do res uh, to do uh, requests for books and such. Um, now, it, it just does a snapshot here of different books uh, that we may be interested in looking at, but most likely uh, the books here may not be of particular interest uh, to any people here because we have somewhere in the order 2590 books that are compiled and we have many other books that are in preparation to be compiled uh, to be again in this cataloging uh, infrastructure. Uh, <clears throat> so if I were to click on one of these uh, thumbnails, uh, in this case here, I still haven't done a search, it'll pop up that book's commons page. So every book that's compiled is, has a commons page. It's basically the front page for that resource that people are able to access. So in this uh, book right here uh, that James Fior has created, uh, uh, I believe is over in New York, a, a series of books. They're actually quite beautiful uh, <clears throat> that addresses uh, operational amplifiers and other electronics. Um, you have access to being able to read it online. So if you click on here, it will go to the book itself. And there you go. And it's hosted on our engineering library. And it has a series of chapters inside each chapter. You can take a look and see the book that's there. Uh, but again, that's more looking at the textbook. And again, the topic of this conversation is the commons and conductor. Uh, it has a series of, in this case, because I'm signed in, I can click on here and I can go to the conductor page. So again, every book that's compiled has a conductor page, a back page that's meant to organize it. Sometimes it's automatically created, uh, but nowadays we've changed the workflow. So you have to create a conductor page before you can create a book. Uh, if I were to click on this page, I can look at the conductor page for that book, which is largely empty because this was a harvesting project. In other words, James did not build on our platform. He built it off of his platform and we brought it in. So there's not much of a conversation or organization here other than a link that goes to the original source uh, and a few additional pieces of information that's useful in order to keep track of it. Uh, now, the, common, the conductor page is open to me because I am uh, the only member on that team. Anyone else wouldn't be able to access uh, the details here in the conductor page, although they will be, they'll get more information about the top level resources. It's just a superficial idea that the project exists. Uh, and if they want to, they can request access to it. So anyways, I'm gonna switch over here and go back to the commons page for the book. So just to summarize, a compiled textbook has the, the textbook, it has a commons page and it has a conductor page. And again, the commons page is an overview here. So you can come in and take a look at the table of contents for that book and the corresponding uh, components that may be of a particular importance for that book. Uh, I'm gonna hide that uh, table of contents. I'm gonna look about this thing. So licensing uh, is a necessary I don't want to call it an evil, but complexity associated with openly license, uh, open license material. In fact, openness or an OER is predicated on licensing. Now, the issue that we have with licensing is that there's a lot of complexity in terms of what licenses you're allowed to choose, how you can remix licenses, how do you actually address the licenses, when are you not allowed to remix licenses or change licenses and such like that. That right there is not a topic of uh, 
a different hour as a topic of a different week in order to be able to discuss in detail. I'll mention that our infrastructure is set up in place so every page can have its own license such that when you actually look at a resource, it can show you that says, well, this are the series of pages and this page here has this license, and this page here has this license, and they're all collected into a book that you're able to move forward. And you're allowed to do that. That book, if, if you have the ability in order to give a single license for the entire book, you can assign that to it, or you can call that book a collection which basically means that it has a hodgepodge of different licensing. Now, if licensing is not your deal, don't worry about it. The key point is that we have a very detailed infrastructure in place in order to keep track of licensing at, in, in this case here, the page level. But when you actually go to editing content in a book, you do this at the block level on the page level like that. Uh, this is more detailed than anybody else does uh, uh, out there in the platform. Uh, and again, this is a, a licensing map or report to give you an idea. And this right here only has uh, one license content. And we have some pages that are undeclared. Most of those are pages that are in our back matter uh, that don't have licensing on it, like the table of contents uh, and licensing map and things like that. So, uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, Mo has a question here. If you give me a moment, let me just finish this and then I'll get back to answering the few questions that are in the chat. Uh, anyone uh, can come in and submit an adoption report saying, I'm an author, I've adopted this book. It then gets stored and then authors are able to access the adoption reports. Uh, they can even have a communication with the people who have adopted their book in order to advance and figure out how uh, resources are used uh, constructively that's, that's out there. Uh, so... Uh, I can submit a peer review uh, off of here. I have the ability, uh, if the book has a homework component to it, in other words, that we've created a collection of questions or we've hard invested a collective collection of questions in the ADAPT homework system that's connected to this book, we'll actually tie it in here so you know that if you adopt this book, you have these series of questions. Now, those questions may or may not be open-ended questions. Let me phrase that. They may not be auto-graded questions, but they will be questions connected with that resource. And uh, in many cases, we have full-blown solutions expand uh, out from uh, either the source material or we've built them ourselves for using our uh, community uh, team. Um, we can download a PDF of the book. We can uh, purchase the book if we want to. So we act as an intermediary between the the content that's stored on our platform and Lulu Express, uh, such that individuals that want to get a text-based, <laughs> a physical copy of the book, they can go about doing so. We do so at near cost. We have a 16% overhead. That's just for handling um, the infrastructure and hosting and other things like that. Other than that, all the money goes straight to the printer and shipping and everything like that. We are not involved in it. Because we are able to operate at cost, or below cost, meaning that we don't make a profit. That means we, we can print up any book, uh, even if they have a non-commercial clause off of it, because again, we're not profiting from this infrastructure. Uh, so uh, digress, you can get a, a page of zip files. You can download the print files if you wanna be able to go to Lulu directly, or if you wanna be able to go to uh, any other print on demand service, if you wanna go to Amazon, you can use their infrastructure uh, in place. We just chose Lulu Express for a handful of different reasons multiple years ago. Uh, and then if you want to be able to download the learning management, sorry, uh, common cartridge file in order to embed into a learning management system, you can click on this and it'll give you an IMS CC file that you can use to embed into your learning management system, whether it's Canvas or Moodle or uh, any other system that's in place. So again, um, there, there are going to be a few additional things connected to the comments uh, in the future, but this is a sort of a front end uh, overview of the resource that's available for people to grab into that don't require signing in in order to be able to access it. So there's a series of questions that, that came into the chat. So let me try to address these things uh, uh, as they come in. Uh, Mo was asking whether she, whether her book is available and compiled and it should be available in the Commons of Conductor. So I'm just going to type her last name and I come up with her book right there. Uh, are you fine with that, Michelle? I found it in the commons, but that version isn't in the conductor. Is it because it's published? Um, 
there there is a conductor page every page has a conductor uh yeah this is the conductor page for that book uh it may not be it, it's public so you should be able to do a search for behavioral statistics in the right. conduct in the conductor page uh and you come with with it right here okay i it's, um, it wasn't working for me so i we, okay, we can take a look at it and, and see. Um, but of course, you're talking about the conductor side. That's uh, the back end after you sign in uh, with it. Um, okay. So then Terry asked the question, to learn remixing, where do we look, please? Okay. So we're having a topic focusing on remixing. Uh, uh, tomorrow? Today. Tomorrow. Okay. Uh, I'm not keeping track of all the things that I'm doing uh, and that addresses explicitly remixing. Uh, Lorraine, can the undeclared be used like an open material? That's actually a really good question. So um, the, the, the term undetermined is really a, not a great term uh, for it. Uh, so this is a really beautiful example of, of getting resources from a variety of different licensing uh, that Michelle did here for her book. So in fact, there shouldn't be a single license available for her book. It's just basically her book is a collection of different contents from different licensing. Now, some of them are undeclared right here <laughs> um, and undeclared comes from several uh, sources or ascribed to different sources it's not saying that it doesn't have an open license it means that we haven't assigned it an open license it may have text on the license on the page itself that says what the license is so for example uh, when we bring in uh, lumen learnings uh, books they don't have a license connected to every page so what they do is they paste it down at the bottom of the page and lumen learning does something similar in fact it's the closest thing that does what we do uh, and they did it many years before we did so they deserve credit for what they've done uh, far above any other platform i've seen out there in regard to licensing um, but they don't have it on a uh, as a single license for their book they just or the single license for their page, they basically make people look at the licensing down below in order to be able to track it. So when we bring it in, uh, we don't want to assign an incorrect license to it. So we keep it as undefined until we manually review, read what they were intending, and then add the license as applicable. The other thing that comes in here is that if a page has content from different licenses, uh, or from different sources with different licenses. Just like here, where you can have pages with different licenses, you can have content from, on, from di with different licenses on a page. And if those licenses conflict with each other, meaning that you're unable to give a single license for that entire page, this is again getting to Creative Commons and licensing issues off of that, then that page itself by definition is a collection, which means that there is no license for that page. Uh, and that's another, uh, we just fool that under, under declared. Uh, so uh, I hate to tell you, you just want to take a look at the question at the page in order to be able to see if, if there's an issue off of that. Uh, and in some cases, the pages that are in the front matter uh, and such, we don't have licensing uh, down there, title page, information page, and things like that. We probably should put something down there in order to make it just complete. Uh, we just keep it undeclared because there you, you can't license a title, you can't license a table of contents. So technically they're, uh, they're public domain uh, and we'll probably flip that on there uh, just in case someone tries to go in and edit it, then there are some issues involved in that. So that's probably more information than what you wanted, Lorraine. Uh, I can certainly address that uh, in more detail if you have uh, after this presentation. Uh, licensing is just really a complicated issue. Um, Carl asked the question, I don't see adapt for this book. Is it because I don't have an adapt account? Uh, yes. Uh, well, maybe. So you're, you're, you're talking about this book right here, I presume. Uh, <clears throat> so if you click on it uh, and I'm not logged in, it will just show or should just show uh, the table contents uh, and the questions that are it, in some cases, it will show the questions. In some cases, it will not. Uh, and there are a variety of reasons behind that. So if the license of the material we bring in is NC licensed, we provide an anonymous presentation of those questions. We just don't provide the solutions, and we don't provide the mechanism in order to solve those uh, questions. Uh, and the reason for that is because the non-commercial clause uh, uh, forbids profiting, we take it very seriously in order to make sure we're in full compliance with that. So not only do we not operate as a profit, we also do share the NC content anonymously, but we don't share the solutions off of there as the original author intended on it because these questions came from that book itself. Uh, but again, that's the case. And then 
you know, you can see attributions here that we provide on uh, each question, but that's an adapt issue. That's not a, a commons of conductor issue. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Carl. I guess I, I may have gone off the different track. I saw the next term here. Uh, and Lorraine said everything is cool. Okay, so uh, with the questions aside, uh, again, to reiterate, every book that's po that's published, which means it's in our catalog, uh, uh, will have a commons page and will have a conductor page, period. You may not be able to access the conductor page depending if it's public or private, or depending upon if you have access to that conductor page um, based off of your, um, if you're added to the page or what your status happens to be. Uh, so let's go and talk about the conductor page, the project management tool associated with the comments. So I'm going to get rid of all these tags here and click on the conductor here. Now the conductor, like I said, is the back end of the technology. In the upper right hand corner, I can flip between the conductor and the commons just back and forth with this button right here. Uh, so this is the uh, landing page for the conductor side. Again, I need an account in order to be able to access. If you don't have an account, you're not going to be able to see this. Yeah. Uh, and it has a handful of different things connected to it uh, on the uh, in these three different columns here. This uh, left column deals with a few additional features that are particularly important in order to access at the, at the top level. I can look at the alerts. If you remember, I was talking about the ability in order to come in and say, if I want uh, a calculus book, I want to get notif notified if a calculus, if a book comes in on into our platform that has the word calculus, in the metadata or in the title, I will then get notified. Uh, and that's useful for well, many reasons uh, out there. And I encourage people in order to capitalize on that resource. I'm gonna delete that. Um, uh, I have a harvesting request where if I have a resource again, that's not in an open resource, that's not in our platform, this is requesting us to go out and bring it into our platform using our harvesting team. Adoption report, like I mentioned before, gives me the opportunity in order to uh, to notify the team, uh, the conductor page, the, notify us, and then we can then notify the author that the book has been uh, has been adopted somewhere. Um, this you don't have access to. Uh, uh, and this is a link that goes to our main uh, website that you can use in order to be able to look and identify more details that you may be interested about the LibreText project, again, front facing. Okay, so that's that in the control panel uh, gives me access to a handful of things that you don't have access to because uh, I'm an, uh, an administrator. One thing in our notice, I'm a verified instructor here, which means that I have the ability uh, to view all resources that are indicated as a verified instructor. So when we actually have a resource we can that we put on here, we have the ability in order to restrict who can see it, whether it's the public, only people who have conductor accounts, only people who have verified instructor accounts, uh, or, or, or only people who are on the team uh, that is meant for internal uh, consumption off of that. And that's an important component, and that's the one that we manually update uh, upon review of every single uh, request that's out there. Um, before I jump in, well, these are pinned projects. These are the projects that I'm able to go back to that I have an important I need to review for one reason or another. It's kind of a long list because I have a lot of things I need to do. These are the last six projects that I have edited or been involved in editing out there, including a Spanish intelligent, artif artificial intelligent book, uh, classical mechanics and, and other things. Um, you'll notice that at the top of this column is the create a project. That right there is meant to create a conductor project from scratch, which we're gonna be doing momentarily. On the right column here are announcements, uh, and these are <laughs> announcements of things that are particularly important for uh, users of the conductor uh, in order to be aware of. Uh, many of them deals with just updates uh, that we've done or uh, workshops that we're doing or other things that are connected uh, to that, including even the release of the launch pad, which we started this conversation with uh, several, uh, actually six months ago. We probably should delete that. Um, uh, so uh, I want to mention the support center. We released this two weeks ago, uh, and it provides a mechanism for individuals that request assistance uh, in order to click on and make tickets up for their assistance. Uh, right now, I click on it, and it goes to my 
uh, dashboard so I can see all the tickets that everyone has requested. Um, and it's gotten quite popular. Uh, and the intent of it here is to remove uh, uh, traditional emailing of concerns and make an, uh, an infrastructure to facilitate a more concerted mechanism to address concerns that people have by bringing in the people that are able to answer those questions. Basically why ticketing systems exist. Um, analytics, I mentioned uh, earlier on uh, in the presentation, uh, the analytics infrastructure is being revamped, um, so I'm not going to go over that right now, but I look forward to being able to discuss this in more detail <laughs> uh, this uh, summer. In fact, uh, most likely at our Leverfest, which is our July uh, uh, professional training uh, session. And projects, if I click on it, it gives me a bigger picture of all the projects that I'm connected to. Um, this is a slower load because I'm actually added to essentially every project out there. Uh, so I have thousands and thousands of projects off of here. This thing here loads up much faster for people who don't have as many projects as I do. Um, I'm going to skip back and go to here. So the first thing in order to advance this work uh, flow is to create an account. Once you create an account, you can come in and the next step is to create a project page. If I click on a project page, I can basically enter a title. So I can say open ed week uh, number two. Uh, I'm going to make this private and I'm going to create the project. And now I've created an empty project which is pretty bare because it's a new project uh, that, that we can use in order to be able to advance that. So before we start to fill these things up, um, let me just check to see the chat. I noticed there was a question by Peg. Are my harvesting requests recorded somewhere on my conductor page? Uh, no, actually they are not, Peg, um, but that's a really good uh, question in order to uh, to tie that in. Uh, we're ultimately going to put uh, the, the adoption requests, not the adoption requests, the harvest requests, uh, along with bookstore requests uh, and a couple other things into the ticketing system. So it's all centralized and you're able to review and go back to it uh, as needed. So thanks for uh, um, reminding me of that. Okay, so back to this empty conductor page. Remember, I can't make a textbook until I create a conductor page, period. So this is the conductor page. I can add people to the conductor page. For example, if I want to add Jennifer Rogers, uh, we have a lot of Jennifer here. I can come in and click on this. And now I've added Jennifer Rogers to my conductor page. Uh, and I can then add various people off of there. There are... Uh, uh, various roles. For example, I can uh, introduce members, I can introduce liaisons, I can introduce auditors, which have different uh, metadata connected to it, but it also has different influence in terms of what they're allowed to do uh, off of here. Okay, so if I go to edit properties, uh, I then enter in a few details associated with this book. Now, many of these things are just information and not necessarily guiding how you use these things. So I'm going to say this is a uh, an open book in progress. I'm going to say this is a construction project. So let's say I'm building it from scratch. I'm not harvesting it. I'm not doing a variety of other things that are connected to it. Uh, I'm going to keep the project private, which means if you were to do a search on open ed week number two, you would not be able to find it. And that may have been one of the concerns that I uh, uh, that I had with uh, Michelle's uh, request here. I could provide a link to a project if it already exists. However, most of the time it won't, so you don't uh, mention that down there. I can provide metadata connected to it. Like I said, I can make this a calculus project. And now when this is saved, um, when this is saved, my alert system would be able to find it and send me a notification that's on it. Uh, for those of you that, uh, that are in California, California has a specialized system for IDs in order to be able to recognize when a specific class is taught in different campuses that reflects the same material. Um, and that's called a CID number or a course ID number. So you can say that, uh, for example, uh, psychology, uh, if you, uh, psych, uh, psych 10120, uh, they may, that course has a set of content related to it and different campuses have different um, numbers associated with that psych course. But if they all have the CID, it provides a mechanism in order to find um, uh, what courses are connected with 
uh, with that. They're doing a great job of describing it. Be able to identify uh, a shared set of criteria for what a course is meant in order to address. And that helps to facilitate articulation, um, especially if the Cal State University system or the um, University of California system follow the same CID approach for doing stuff, which it actually, they don't, but they're working on being able to advance that. So this is just another metadata that's connected to here. Um, I mentioned uh, psych. I'm sure that there's a, I don't know if there's a behavioral, there's no behavioral psychology in uh, the CID number. So not every course has a CID number connected to it. Anyways, for those of you that are outside of California, uh, you now have been introduced to that. Those inside California have greater uh, exposure to it than that. I have the ability in order to identify what campus that uh, this resource is connected to. So if you say it's from Bellevue College, I can do that. If I want to upload a thumbnail connected to it, I can then go about doing that. If I have a homework assignment connected to it, I can get a code from the ADAPT homework and paste it in here. That again goes back to the question that Carl mentioned uh, a while ago. If I'm harvesting the project, I can actually uh, type in the credentials for attribution for that resource so that I'll always be able to go back in order to be able to find that resource and more importantly in order for me to ensure that I'm giving proper attribution to those resources upon search off of here. And there are a handful of other things in that asset settings that I don't want to go into. And then you have a summary uh, of content which is here written under notes. If I save that, it looks a little bit different. Uh, I have a greater team. I have a little bit of notes. I have a little bit of details off of here. Before I actually start creating the book, uh, and I know that we are getting pressed for time, so I'm going to try to end this in about five minutes. Uh, we have threads, so you can come in and follow threads just like we would for a forum or other sake. So I can basically have a conversation. This is the best uh, conductor page around. In this case here, I'm notifying each uh, team member. So Jennifer then got an email saying that I've notified them for this. I can identify who I actually want uh, to have this construction off of here. This is meant in, play, in part to take uh, to have more concerted uh, and contextual discussions. And while it's connected to email, it's meant in order to be able to organize this as the central uh, uh, writing infrastructure for it. I mentioned files when I was talking about the commons and con Dr. or the co Campus Commons for the California Education Learning Lab, um, which uh, I will just leave it at this, but I can actually write lots of resources down on here and uh, apply different aspects to that. Actually, maybe it's worthwhile for me to do that. Let me grab this organic chemistry book uh, project. Here they've created a series of uh, uh, directories. If I click on the directory, I can see several different Word documents. Uh, it, this, these documents are only available to verified instructors. So only users that we have verified then have the ability in order to tap into this. And then it has all the licensing and other information that's connected to this in order to be able to make this thing uh, work uh, constructively. The, uh, I'm trying to end this a little bit because we're transitioning into the next presentation uh, very soon. Uh, tasks is what we use in order to be able to identify um, projects that we want sub teams in order to be able to focus on. I give you an example of that with, uh, in regards to us building the solutions for the OpenStax uh, chemistry book. Um, but we have similar breakdowns and based on chapters for teams that are actually organizing uh, it. Um, and it's essentially an exceedingly powerful infrastructure for uh, managing teams because it's a ma project management uh, tool. Okay. So don't have a great deal of time here. I'll mention that I can create a book uh, off of here. This creates a template uh, for the book, a front matter, back matter, and I'm able to then uh, access the book and remix the book using the conductor as the interface uh, for that. Um, that's not overly important off of here. Uh, I encourage you to have accounts in order to be able to take a look at that. Uh, I mentioned timeline, peer reviews provide an infrastructure. We have no peer reviews for this book here, but if you go to some of the other uh, resources we have collected those peer reviews again they're curatable uh, so they just just don't keep them around um, when they have lost their utility and lastly is accessibility and accessibility um, uh, it's actually exceedingly powerful as a thread capability off of here but if we actually want to uh, where are we 
have we not created a We, I need to take a quick look at why this is not coming up. It may be because of an update that we recently did. What it will bring in is all the table of contents for uh, our book, and it provides an opportunity in order to meta, do meta, do toggle switches on the criteria that's used for WCAG 2.1 compatibility. Um, and that's important in order to ensure that we are handling accessibility issues off of here. I'm almost done, Mariana, uh, and then we'll transition into AI. Uh, <clears throat> so I will stop here. Um, there are a handful of other uh, benefits associated with the Commons the Conductor. We are slowly merging uh, all the technologies that we have been running separately uh, on our pages into the Commons the Conductor. We call it the great integration, such that you can go to the Commons the Conductor and use the Conductor page in order to not just be able to organize the team as a project management tool, but also to do all the other issues that you'd want to have on the back end, including being able to compile, make uh, uh, make cover pages, uh, be able to facilitate remixing and, and ultimately connect to uh, the homework infrastructure and the other parts of the Laborverse that makes uh, the infrastructure that we put in place, uh, I believe, fairly impressive for people to capitalize on.